All right. So we're here with Chris Dreyer with rankings.io. What's up, Chris? Hey, what's up, Andy? Thanks for having hey, me. Thanks for coming on. So today we're going to talk about SEO, one of the, uh, the, the things that law firms uh, love and hate the most. <laughs> one of the things that I want to ask you about right away, and this is something I hear lawyers say all the time, is I don't know what SEO company to trust. Everyone says that we're doing backlinking, we're doing content and all this stuff, but it, it never works, right? So how, do, how does a law firm decide which SEO company they can trust and more importantly, which companies they should walk away from? <laughs> Best thing I would say is to have a conversation with them, see if you vibe with them, because it is more of a uh, marathon, not a sprint, right? You're going to be working with this individual or these individuals for a, a long period of time. We like to say, we have a saying, you know, it's proof, not promises. It's showcase studies, talk about results, talk about situations that didn't go well and what worked well, and, and really talk about those. I, you also want to look for an agency that has a lot of processes and that are not just bespoke doing everything, you know, blank canvas. It's asking the right question. The thing is, I know that a lot of prospects want to talk to references. Who's going to give a bad reference? Like to me, it's a waste of time. I think it's, you need to do your own investigation. You need to have at least some basis of knowledge to ask the right questions. And that's what you need to do is, is see if you have a, a company that has results that you can get along with, that, that set its expectations and that you trust. The reality is that most people don't realize the difference between a competitive and a non-competitive keyword. So there's a lot of stuff like that. And you know, one of the things that I always see is like rankings, guarantees, and things like that. Those always are a red flag for me because at the end of the day, I, I know from experience, and maybe you've experienced this as well, you can do the same thing 10 different times and get 10 completely different results just based on the fact that we don't control Google, we don't control the competition, we don't control a lot of things. But like, what do you feel are maybe some red flags or maybe some kind of warning signs when you're talking to an SEO company? It's funny, this whole topic of guarantees. It's every marketing agency wants a risk reversal or wants a guarantee, right? Because it helps the psychological component in terms of conversions mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature. But they are so difficult. If someone says that, hey, you don't pay until we get results, well, let's think about the implications of that. They may go buy a ton of Fiverr links, a whole bunch of spam links and shoot a whole bunch of, of poor quality content at your website. And cool, you know, it's one of those asynchronous bets. Cool, if, if they win, they start, they get paid. But if they mm -hmm. lose, it's not them that's in trouble. It's, it's, the, it's the business that paid for that opportunity that may have negative repercussions forever. I think that the biggest thing that you want to avoid is letting an agency just totally productize your marketing. It's every situation's different. You have different average, you know, assets that you're going to use as leverage. There's different chinks in the armor in terms of your competition, in terms of benchmarking, in terms of quantitative and qualitative actions. You know, I read Sell Like Crazy. I think it's Sabri Subri. So I, I read his book and he does a tremendous job on Facebook ads. And I've, he's a very intelligent guy. And he has that, you know, hey, if you don't rank in 90 days, it's like a, like a free risk reversal. I'm thinking well, exactly what you're thinking. Well, mm -hmm. what are the terms that they're targeting? Yeah. Are these these very bottom of the funnel transactional terms or these super long tail that anyone can rank for? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that answers your original question, but the best piece of advice I can give you is be really hesitant to look for these types of guarantees and then make sure you do a lot of due diligence on the front end in terms of discovery, in terms of analysis and setting expectations, make sure there's a, an actual strategy towards the long-term goal. That leads me to another question I have is firms come to us with very, very big expectations. I'm sure they do to you as well, right? And, and those expectations mm -hmm. sometimes have to just be managed back down to reality, just like lawyers, their clients come to them with very big expectations. And sometimes the lawyers have to bring them back down to reality. But what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you hear about SEO and kind of the biggest reality checks that you kind of sometimes have to give clients right away? The first one's how long does SEO take? Every single situation is going to be different. If you're in a, a new website in a major market, it may not take six months. It may take 14 months or two years to really dominate in that metro based upon your investment. It takes quantitative actions and qualitative. Quantitative in, in the number uh, of articles, the, the keywords that you're targeting. I think of SEO as like a you're building a library and every single article that you put on your book or on your in your library is a book that a consumer could grab from that library. It is not a, a TV series or a show where you're hitting this regular cadence. SEO works a little bit different from a poll type of method. So the first is th the length of time for SEO is different for everyone. 
in some situations, we've taken on major projects. We just took on a major Florida law firm working with a different SEO agency. Horrible, horrible architecture issues. They're indexing tag pages and category pages. They had um, no follow link set up. They had just major issues with their menu and their architecture. And within a matter of two months, there was exponential increase. And it was just fixing the architecture. And that was in a two-month period, not a six-month period. That was a two-month period. We've had other situations where maybe a firm has a big brand. They've been doing TV advertising and radio, and they, they have that brand recognition where they could get a jump start in a major market more quickly than a new firm. So it really just depends on your targets. The other thing is like, I know that every personal injury attorney, for example, listening wants motor vehicle accidents, but there are different tactics to approach that segment. Maybe not going after car accident lawyer at the beginning, maybe going after Uber, Lyft, Grubhub, motorcycle accident, all these other variations that may have less competition than that, that top you know, vanity term. So that's one misconception is, is how long does SEO take? The real issue here is when SEO agencies don't set expectations on the front end. I, I, we, have a, we have this whole process of onboarding our clients. We call, our, we, we call it teach our clients not to be crazy. And, all, and here's the deal. Clients become crazy when you don't set expectations, when you don't tell them how long it's going to take to get SEO results, when you don't tell them about your link building process or your content process, that's when they become crazy. You don't tell them about your communication cadence. So it's setting expectations on the front end that you all agree upon and then, and then hitting those milestones, hitting, upon, hitting those agreements. And it could, be, it could be anything, but in terms of what those expectations are, but in general, I would say, particularly in the legal vertical, Annie, because I know you guys work a ton in the legal legal space as well, is the biggest misconception is the amount of quantitative actions you need to take to get results from an SEO mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. Most of the time, just people aren't doing enough. It, it's highly saturated, very competitive, and your X amount of blogs per month that, that we talked about previously, you, you just have to get a little bit more creative. You have to do more. It's not about word count. It is about answering consumer intent. It is about quality. And, and I would say those are the two biggies is most of the time, there's not enough quantitative and qualitative actions. And the other is expectations are set poorly. And the time to deliver results is unique based upon who you are as a firm and as a client. The biggest uh, misconception that I see about SEO is I'm a better lawyer. Why aren't I ranking higher? Google yeah. has no idea let's, who the best lawyer is. <laughs> let's talk about that for just a moment. And you're going to really love this. It's never talked about. And, mm -hmm. and we talked about this before we started the podcast about the importance of reviews and the map pack and yeah. from a local perspective, is the type of firm that you are can mm -hmm. have a huge impact on your ability to get SEO results. Yeah. If you are a litigating firm that is only looking to sign up one case a month and how many review opportunities you're going to get? Not very many. You're not taking very many cases. Yeah. And Google factors in the review count and score in terms of your local ranking. So versus a settlement firm that I know everyone talks down upon, that takes those, you know, very minor injuries, those soft tissue injuries, they may get hundreds of reviews. In some situations, they stand a better chance to rank just simply because they have more, you know, swings at the plate, so to speak. Well, you look at some of the most, uh, some of the most competitive cities, Los Angeles, Orlando, Las Vegas, every firm there has a thousand reviews or more. You know, Google is, is definitely putting more emphasis on reviews now than I think they ever have before. What we're seeing from our own clients is that first of all, having reviews is not enough. You have to be continually getting reviews. Like you can never stop getting reviews. On top of that, you have to have reviews that are going to have words, phrases, keywords, synonyms that are related to your practice area, because that's going to tell Google that you're actually relevant, which is one of the three main ranking factors in the local algorithm, you know? So there's another misconception. I'll, I'll give you another one is that for maps, we see a lot of times, and I don't know, you know, maybe you guys are different than this, but for maps, what we have found is that a big misconception is that lawyers can hire us and walk away and, and never assist us with anything. You know, there's certain things that we cannot do. There's certain citations that we cannot build for you without your assistance. We cannot go out and get reviews for you. You know what I mean? We can't take pictures and, and upload them and, and things like that. And, you know, there's certain elements that it's like, we can get you to the goal line, but we got, you got to help us get it over the goal line. And that's one of the things that usually like those small details are the things that typically are the difference between like a hugely successful campaign and one that's just kind of mediocre. Because the reality is, is that at the end of the day, we're going to, we're going to do the linking. We're going to do the content. We're going to do the research. We, you know, we use surfer SEO. I don't know if you guys use surfer SEO. So like all of our stuff 
is in line with where it needs to be. You know, it's like the mm -hmm. little detail. What's interesting. I, I just did a, a competitive analysis for Las Vegas. You mentioned Las Vegas yeah. just recently, you know, Kuttner, here's, here's a couple things that I just wanted to, to kind of agree and validate what you're saying. Mm -hmm. He's got 1100 reviews. And, you know, Learn and Row, who, who is massive firm, you know, nine figures had around 500 in Vegas. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Kuttner's dominating. The other thing is that when I did this analysis, I looked at number of index pages. And here's what's really interesting. Kuttner had 522 index pages. The next highest all had more than that, 1,000, mm -hmm. 2,000 pages. And so the difference is his site was focused on these really dense answering every version of con consumer intent on his practice area pages, whoever's doing his SEO. But yeah, you're exactly right. So when I was doing this com competitive analysis for this potential prospect and I saw the review disparity, I'm just like, look, these are the things that we can do. See these backlinks, this backlink gap, see this content, you know, the structure, the architecture. This is going to be a challenge. You mm -hmm. know, how are we going to attack this? I think a lot of times that's lost, but otherwise, I mean, it's a real conversation that you have to have. It brings a good question because like reviews themselves are not always just enough. Like they've got to have, they've got to have where if you just have a, a review that just says, thanks, that's not that great. You know, like, sorry, I always tell clients to tell their clients to answer five questions when they're leaving the review. And what's cool about that is that everybody always, that's one of my biggest things that lawyers tell me is I've asked my clients to leave me reviews and they don't do it. Tell me if you've heard that one before. Um, oh so, yeah, there's... <laughs> their strategies, those micro commitments, don't add, don't send just the link to review out of the gate, get the yeah. micro commitment of, yes, I will leave review because they've already committed, then send it. And, and since they've committed, then you can follow up and it's not super obnoxious. The other thing, just validating what you're saying is, you know, I know there's a lot of firms out here that are looking to, you know, I'm not saying, I don't want to use the word bride, but, but they're doing tactics in terms to get to reviews. Like, well, they'll, they'll do like a grassroots campaign, maybe a backpack giveaway or something. But then when the reviews all talk about the backpacks mm -hmm. and you see those keywords at the top, like most use phrases and it'll say, you know, backpack, <laughs> that's not necessarily helping the SEO endeavors. It may from like a total number of reviews, maybe a psychological component, yeah. but maybe not the relevancy component. So this is what's interesting, right? Is that we have found that you have to have four and a half stars, right? That, that you have to have. If you have a million, if you, if you have 5,000 reviews and you're two stars, nobody's calling you, right? So you have to have four and a half stars or higher. We found the four and a half and five, there's no difference there. The second thing that's the most important is the quantity of reviews. We've seen before where there's three firms in there. The other two firms had 15 and 10 reviews. Our client had five reviews. So I said, go get, and they weren't getting any calls. I was like, go get, go get 20 reviews over the weekend. And I promise you, you'll be getting calls. Uh, so they actually did it. And the next week was the business, busiest week in the history of their firm. And the only thing that changed was they had more reviews, right? That's super important, but you're right. We actually had a client last year who did a really big giveaway. I'm not going to, I don't want to call them out, but they did a really big giveaway. They got about 400 reviews using very similar tactics to what you talked about where they did the giveaway from a rankings and a relative relevancy and everything perspective, nothing changed. Google's able to ascertain these are not reviews that are on, on topic here. You know, it's, it's really interesting yeah. how smart Google is. Yeah. And let's, let's talk about the 4.5 thing too. So here's, here's one of the big reasons, not only from a, a social proof perspective, but I like to use the example of imagine that you were going on vacation and you typed in best restaurants near me. Would you expect to see anything with a two or a three or even a four? You'd expect to see five star. So right. I know that there are restrictions upon our copywriting practices in terms of using superlatives like top and best and specializes and things like that in the legal vertical. Mm -hmm. Having said that, in order to rank for best car accident lawyer, top car accident lawyer, you have to have a high review rating. So if you drop below that 4.5, you won't even show up for those queries in the map pack, even if you did have the most reviews and yeah. had the best SEO strategy. Yeah. It's just really interesting how we've seen that happen to clients. We've seen clients that are in the maps ranking really well. They got four and a half stars and then they drop down. And it's funny because like, People freak out about getting a negative review. Like a lot of times people don't ask for reviews at all because they don't want negative reviews. There's actually a study that they did. They found, they surveyed like tens of thousands of people and found that 82% of people do not believe your reviews if there's no negative reviews because nobody's perfect, mm -hmm. right? If you have 500 five-star reviews, your people are not going to believe that the, the reviews are real. They're going to assume that they're fake because nobody's perfect. So I yeah. always tell lawyers, just chill out, just focus on getting good reviews understand that negative reviews are essentially going to help you because you can also respond to them and you should respond to them. 
and you can actually show how you handle customer service situations. And there's a lot of good that can come from negative reviews if you have enough positive reviews. When you don't have enough positive reviews, that's where the negative reviews really start to hurt you. I couldn't agree more with that too. And I don't know if you caught this recently where on the Ed Milet show, he interviewed Alex Hermosi and mm -hmm. they were talking about marketing. They were talking about most marketing is a linear equation. You do more input, you get more output. You do more mm. ad spend, you get more visibility. The one that's nonlinear is referrals. Mm. And because those are exponential, you get introduced to one, they get introduced to two, they introduce you to this and it's exponential. Yeah. So I think yeah. that when you don't ask for reviews and there's no opportunity to receive feedback, then you're just setting yourself up for failure in, in terms of the, the best thing that there is on the back end to lower your cost for acquisition, which is rever referrals. Yeah. When you have higher volume, it's exponentially easier than these lower volume firms that take one or two cases a month, you know, just because of the fact that you just simply don't have the numbers. And it's funny because reviews are just like referrals. It's a snowball effect. When somebody has 500 reviews, you're going to attract, first of all, you're going to rank higher, but that, which is going to bring more clients in. And then those people are going to see, or I guess leads, and then they're going to see all the reviews that you have. So they're going to trust you more. So they're going to hire you. And then with those comes referrals and friends and families and, and different things like that plus more reviews, which means that you're going to get more clients, which means you're going to get more reviews. And it's a snowball effect. You know, it's, it's so interesting. And then you have the opportunity to rent out and have your own concert. And, yeah, you and then know. you hire Pitbull. And yeah, exactly. Right. You know? <laughs> SEO is always changing, right? So, you know, I talked earlier about how we did stuff in 2012 that I would cringe if we were doing it today, but it was very same, successful back then. Buddy. Yeah, exactly. So what is the stuff that you hear that people think works like that no longer works? If you're focusing on word count and just cranking out articles, that's a big no-no, right? With the Google helpful content. The biggest one is when we're evaluating links. The biggest mis misconception ever is to focus only on domain rating and domain authority. Huge misconception. That can be manipulated. That can They can buy expired domains. They could be irrelevant. The biggest misconception is looking at domain authority as a standalone metric to evaluate your, your prospects or, or where you're trying to acquire or earn links. And it needs to be in combination. It needs to be in combination with, you know, their spam score, with the quality of content. Is their site curated? Does it have organic traffic? They have high authority, but it, it also gets a lot of traffic. So you need to look at more metrics similar to when you go to evaluate a page on your website. A lot of times you hear, oh, that's, that's a high bounce rate. That statistic on its own is completely irrelevant. <laughs> because a consumer could go to that page and get everything that they need and leave. And that could be a great experience for them. But you need to look at it as at in, in comparison to other metrics like dwell time and time on page. So those are some of the things that are just in terms of the links, it's propagated through SEO agencies, right? Selling links. Mm -hmm. There's so many of these link brokers. And the first thing that they say on their pricing page is you get a DRX for X amount of price. And, and, the attorneys eat it up. Oh, I got a DR60. Oh, by the way, that site receives zero traffic. It doesn't mm -hmm. help you. That's a big one. There are a lot of opinions based upon studies that I have on how to do things like mm -hmm. flat architecture versus, you know, using subfolders or access or the number of uh, links on your menu and load speed and things like that. But in general, I think it comes down to three big pillars, right? It's it's content. That's the words and phrases. That's the opportunity. Content is not king. It is table stakes in legal vertical. Let's mm -hmm. do some divergent thinking here. It is uh, it is table stakes. You have to have a great website. It has to showcase your expertise. You have to have social proof. You have to have a way of standing out and being different. And that's table stakes. And then you have to find a way to get links. That's the real challenge. I think when you people go out to hire digital agencies, if they're focused on the big picture, because even on, from a local maps perspective, relevance, distance, prominence, the first example they give you is links mm -hmm. and that definition on Google support page. Yeah. Most of the time, there just isn't a great strategy there. And yes, we can do directories. You, you can do guest posting if it's on good sites, but there has to be some intentionality there. And I would say the biggest misconception is, is uh, the link tactics. And it's just and, not talked about. Which, by the way, I'm pretty sure that all link building for the intention of building links in Google eyes is against their terms of service. You know, <laughs> but. The reality is, is that you can't cut corners. Like there's so many different ways you can get links. The best ways to do it are the hardest ways to do it. You know, it's like actually providing really good content, providing value and, and doing things like that. There's other shortcuts that we've, we've used that we don't, we don't use too much anymore, but even like sponsorships and 
stuff like that. But that only gets you so far. A big pet peeve of mine is sem- is like the semantic use of of links. Like like so. So what what I mean by that is they'll say, okay, guest posting is bad. Mm-hmm. Logger outreach is good. Digital PR is better. And a lot of times those individuals that are selling you those different services, they're all the same thing. They're pitching mm-hmm. the same service. They're just, they're just putting a different name on it right, yeah. on the box. I will say that, you know, you look at people like Neil Patel, like why did he buy Uber suggest and, and answer the public? The reason he bought those is because they attract inbound links. It's a great mm-hmm. strategy. Acquisition is an amazing strategy for law firms. It's it's not utilized very, very often, but look at like Clio, how well it works in the same search engines. Like how many law firms have a content strategy better than Clio? I, probably quite a few of these nationwide players, but Clio's earning these links because they're linking to the tool. Mm-hmm. They naturally acquire inbound links. That's why Thompson Reuters and Fine Law, you know, their whole legal directory and archive, they're just acquiring links like, like crazy. There has to be some different thought process in terms of earning these links. And it's, how do you make your site linkable? You can only do so much manual effort. There's no leverage there. You're looking yeah. for leverage. Leverage is the name of game, no matter if it's labor leverage, employees or tools or AI or whatever. But even from a link perspective, you're looking for leverage. For me, what I've found is that the internet is an ecosystem and you can have great SEO, but your SEO is exponentially going to be more effective if you're also putting out great content on social, if you're also creating helpful videos, if you're also doing you know, all these other things. And we watched as we turned this campaign and the campaign started working really, really well, we noticed that his organic website traffic went up also. The first thing here is is the difference between lead generation and demand generation. Mm -hmm. Lead generation and direct response, those are very easy to attribute, you know, your goal conversions and your tracking. Demand generation and brand awareness is very hard to to put attribution to. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. I know that you've probably seen this yourself, right? We're talking about TikTok and YouTube and the podcast where you get these leads in. And if you just had a form fill or you looked at your analytics, it wouldn't paint the true picture. But if you left it blank and you said, how did you hear about us? Yeah. They may have said, oh, I I listened to you on a podcast and I caught a couple of your videos. Like Mm -hmm. attribution gets murky. Yeah. The thing from an SEO perspective specifically though, is traffic itself can contribute to the activity of your website getting crawled and providing those signals from their rank brain perspective of their algorithm. But what we found was the traffic itself helped elevate all of our other pages because it brought a lot of activity to the site to get it crawled. If the traffic is healthy and they're interacting with your website, the paid traffic can help your website. So that's that's kind of been my experience from it. Here's what you have to understand. When you're doing SEO, you are literally competing against the smartest thing that's ever been created. And It sounds dramatic, but when you think about how many billions of dollars they make every quarter, I mean, it really has to be the smartest thing ever created. You know, it's just, it's crazy because once the integrity of it goes down, then everybody games it, nobody trusts it anymore. Google doesn't want the same in terms, especially- Again, Google doesn't want you to figure out the algorithm because if they did, then you could game it and it would lose, you'd lose confidence. Well, in duplicate content, right? You canonicalize the first version of the content. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of not the skyscraper technique. Mm-hmm. Brian Dean really made a killing. And, and look, I get hats off to Brian. He does an amazing job from an SEO perspective. But the skyscraper technique is go look at it and make it a little better, right? I, I say make it different. If they're, if everyone's structuring and formatting an article and it has one point of view, go make it different. Like by the nature of being different, you're automatically going to stand out. What can lawyers do to help their SEO companies deliver the best results for them? Number one, we already talked about, be focused on reviews. Look, if it's me you're working with, if it's my SEO agency, I'm telling you to put your head down and do anything possible to get reviews and let us take the wheel from there. I'm Mm -hmm. telling you, that's the biggest gap. That's the biggest issue. There's all kinds of strategies. I don't care if you're having to bonus your employees. I'm not talking about paying for reviews. It's different. I'm I'm talking about incentivizing the behavior, even doing team-based competitions, You know, making it top of mind with a weekly newsletter, the number of reviews. I don't care what you have to do, get reviews. That's what you can do yep. to help. The second thing I would tell you is to be open to editorial quotes and providing content as the expert. There are some situations where a ghostwritten article or an article written by an SEO agency is just not going to have the same impact as if they had your unique perspective and your unique information. Particularly, even from a link acquisition standpoint, we're talking about Hero, help a reporter out. That can go a long way. So I would say reviews. 
I would also talk about just being open to help from the content perspective. It could be content on your site or content externally. Those are the two biggest things that I can tell you it will help tremendously. Chris, thank you so much for hanging out, me, out with me today. It's a lot of fun. We should do this more often. I had a good time yeah, talking absolutely. to you. <laughs> thanks, Andy. Thanks awesome, for having cool. me, Andy.